and thank you for being here with all of us for the 92Y Talks. This one's online, but that's okay. It'll be just as intense and interesting. We're going to dig into something that is one of those perennial debates. Uh, we're calling it the great debate, selfless or selfish. And we have several perspectives here that I think you'll find quite compelling as we all come together together in a, a sort of a, a clash of great ideas, I hope. Uh, my name is Richard Louis. I'm a, a news anchor over at MSNBC and NBC News. Uh, joining me uh, in the boxes you see in front of you, Dr. Jamil Zaki. We also have uh, Nancy French, as well as David French. A little bit of, of their backgrounds. Uh, Dr. Zaki is a professor of psychology at Stanford University and the director of the Stanford Social Neuroscience Lab. Uh, they use tools from psychology as well as neuroscience. Uh, he and his colleagues examine how empathy works, uh, how people can learn to empathize more effectively. And his writings on these topics have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, and the Atlantic. He lives in San Francisco with his wife and their two daughters. Uh, Nancy French is a five-time New York Times best-selling author. She has written multiple books for Olympians, political leaders, television personalities, political dissidents, and television stars. Her most recent book is a collaboration with Alice Marie Johnson on Afterlife, My Journey from Incarceration to Freedom, with a foreword by Kim Kardashian West. She also has written essays in numerous publications, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, as well as USA Today, Parents, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the National Review. She is in Columbia, Tennessee with her husband, David. Yes, he's also here with us. And their three children <laughs> and a couple of pets, a small zoo, as I like to call it. You can, of course, see her at nancyfrench.com. Uh, David's here too. David French, an attorney, political commentator, a New York Times bestselling author, uh, a graduate of Harvard Law School. He served as a lecturer at Cornell Law School and spent much of his career representing religious liberty cases as senior counsel for the American Center for Law and Justice and the Alliance Defending Freedom. He is the past president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, a senior fellow at the National Review Institute. Uh, David is currently the senior editor of the Dispatch and a columnist for Time, having previously served as a staff writer for the National Review. His latest book, uh, one of his latest books is Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. Boy, I think I've got one right here too. How about that? Uh, <laughs> and by the way, Nancy and I, it, her, her latest collaboration, yes, uh, was uh, with Ms. Johnson. And, and now it's she and I. Uh, she, she was my book Sherpa, but we'll get more into that a little bit later, uh, getting to enough about me, the unexpected power of selflessness. Um, so if all, all of you agree, how about we start with a little bit of science first, uh, and then we can all uh, dig into that. Uh, Jamil, dig into this great debate for us. We're sitting on the stage of the 92Y. This is a place where we like to think big, 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 big. So go big for us on this great debate of selfless or selfish. What are we? I mean, it's one of the fundamental questions about human nature, really, and it's one that we've been batting around as long as people have talked about ourselves at all, right? So you see in philosophical traditions, going back to people like Thomas Hobbes, but even further back to sort of debates within the Confucian tradition, you had some scholars arguing that people are naturally wayward and that the role of civilization is to tamp down our instincts, which if left free would cause us to destroy ourselves and each other. You had other scholars who would argue that actually people are naturally good and the role of society and civilization should be to allow those instincts to express themselves. I think that as a research psychologist, one of the fascinating things to me is that we don't have to just argue about this. We can measure and, and collect data and analyze. And the, the results of a lot of that work, which I'm happy to get into in more detail uh, later, is of course the answer is both, right? That we have both of these types of instincts within us. A big question then becomes, uh, how strong are each of those instincts? In what context are they expressed? And can we change them? 
So, you know, as, as a researcher in my lab, um, we have really studied the sunny side of human nature quite a bit, and there's a lot to say about it, right? I mean, the, the stereotype that people are fundamentally selfish is simply overwritten time after time by data, right? So uh, American citizens donated about $500 billion to charity in 2019. Uh, indications are that that number will be greater for 2020. Um, but even if you take people and put them in the least selfless context that you can imagine, economic games where people anonymously are given the option to share money with someone who they'll never meet or not share money with that person. There's no reputational cost. They won't be shamed if they don't share. They'll, there's really no reason for them to do so. In those contexts, people are still generous. Hmm. And research from my lab demonstrates that there's also a biological basis to this. So for instance, when people receive money uh, and also see somebody they know receive money, they activate very similar parts of their brains as though we are re rewarded, not just by our own benefits, but by those that we see other people receive. And that overlap between self and other is one of the forces that drives us towards kindness. So one way of summing this up, you know, I'm not here to argue that people are only selfless, but I think that there is a great deal of selflessness in us. And I think that that creates all sorts of benefits for not just our culture, but us as individuals. Well, okay, we'll start uh, sunny and shiny for a moment, but uh, we're gonna have to go to the other side shortly. So don't get too comfortable, Dr. Saki. Uh, we're, we're gonna go there. Uh, Nancy, uh, one of the chapters you and I worked on was, was, is it even possible? Is selflessness even possible? And, and what was sort of the, as, as we were working on it, what what stood out to you in that that debate? Is it even possible? I, I believe in that chapter they talked. We talked. You talked a great deal about Darwinism and his theories, and if we really are designed to take care of ourselves in order to propagate our species, in order to make sure that we survive, it seems like selfishness is the way to go, just evolutionarily. Um, and I. Um, in my own life, I have very selfish tendencies that pop up frequently. Um, and I'm wondering no. if that's why I was, <laughs> I should not have my husband on this, on this. <laughs> um, but I wondered when uh, Jamil was talking, if that's why I was invited on to be the, the prototypical selfish person to share my experiences. Um, but uh, in that chapter, you know, we just talked about the history of thought on it and whether or not Darwinism and the way that it, uh, affects the world in a biological way, does it also have those, does it also have a ramification for us personally? And so we sort of examined that. And, um, you know, I think as Jamil was saying, it's, it's not one or the other. I think both are very present in our lives, but I think it's very important to recognize that dichotomy to not overestimate your goodness or to underestimate your goodness, because both of those things have negative ramifications in your life. And the French family lives it out um, in many different ways. And, and David, as you look back at uh, the decisions you've made, not only certainly in, in your in your great writings, uh, but also the decisions you've made in your life, uh, how might you reflect on this great debate? Yeah, you know, I think that there's this tension frequently between the aspirational and the actual. So you imagine yourself how you want to be. You imagine yourself like, I want to be brave. I want to be selfless. I want to be generous. These are the ways I want to characterize myself. And, and if there's one thing that, you know, I've not met too many people who want to be selfish, that, that that's how they want to describe themselves. But, you know, what I found is that you get this real tension between when the person you want to be um, becomes, that becomes costly. Like yeah. it starts to cost you something. If I have to sacrifice something to be the person that I want to be, that's where the rubber really meets the road. And we'll find a million reasons to rationalize and justify sort of not that ultimate commitment. And, you know, one of the things I think that was powerful in, in the book is talking about your, you know, with your own family situation, you face this this very meaningful choice and how to help take care of your father where you've got the aspirational and then this actual reality that requires sacrifice and you know i say time and time again we face the longer we live the more we face that 
And one of the things that I've realized over time is sometimes you rise to the occasion and sometimes you don't. We face that dichotomy that says sometimes we're going to meet our aspiration and sometimes we're not. And, and coming closer and closer to that aspiration is kind of a lifelong walk and goal. So, so that is a, a great setup back to you, Dr. Zaki, uh, is when do we f- go one side or the other on this, right? What, what, is that, what is that scale that we're using in our brain? Yeah, I really appreciate uh, what both Nancy and David are saying here. And I, I think if I can sort of back up a little bit, I, I think that sometimes we dichotomize selfishness and selflessness, even the term selflessness implies that in order to do for others, we must sacrifice ourselves, that there's always this scale that's just weighing these two against one another. And one of the things that my group and I study the most is empathy or the idea that oftentimes we're quite emotionally interconnected with one another. And when you feel that connection to another person, sometimes that actually resolves any conflict between selfishness and selflessness because doing for them, right? So for instance, if I see someone in pain and it feels to me like it hurts to see them in pain, then Mm -hmm. it might not be that selfless for me to help them. In fact, the psychologist Adam Grant suggests that we replace terms like selflessness with otherishness and Mm -hmm. sort of say that we can be selfish and otherish, meaning that we have motivations that drive us to be there for other people. But sometimes those motives are aligned, not in conflict with what we want for ourselves. Um, And empathy is one of the bridges that can create that connection. And to get back to Nancy's point about sort of the Darwinian perspective. Yes, it's true that natural selection uh, favors animals and people that survive and pass on their genes. Sometimes I feel like that has been translated to uh, a psychological equivalent of Darwinism as though we are uh, sort of programming our own Darwinistic outputs. Like we're saying, well, this gives, this decision gives me a 95% chance of survival and this decision only gives me, but we don't do calculations like that at least most of the time. And oftentimes instead we are imbued by nature with instincts that are otherish because those instincts at an ultimate big picture level actually do help us, right? So for instance, it behooves me to sacrifice a lot for my daughters. Richard, I know you sacrificed a lot also for your, for your father, right, in, in helping him. And those could be argued to be quite uh, consistent with Darwinian uh, preservation, right? Because when we help people we're related to, that helps us as well. But that can extend as well to people in our community, people in our coalitions. And actually it would be really smart for a group of people to help each other in order to survive and thrive themselves. But is it really sacrifice? Because sacrifice sort of implies I'm giving away and losing. I, 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 like, I, I would like to think that sometimes it's additive, that it is one plus one equals three. Oh, 100%. And I think that's what I'm trying to get us past is that, you know, as David was saying, there can be an aspirational version of ourselves and then our own selfish desires. And, and I think, David, you're exactly right that oftentimes those are in conflict. But I do want to be clear that from a psychological perspective, at least, I don't think they're always in conflict at all, right? So oftentimes when we do for others, we help ourselves in all sorts of ways, not just materially. We might do for somebody else, help them and lose money, for instance, but feel much better about ourselves, feel that our actions are more aligned with the person we want to be. We might feel more socially connected. And those uh, experiences of meaning and being part of something greater than ourselves are some of, some of the most powerful additive benefits for our psychological, mental, and even physical health. There is a, you know, there's a Christian principle there that to, to gain your life, you lose it. And that, that's sort of the additive power of uh, selflessness, or I, I like the other-ishness. I like, I like that formulation that there is absolutely when in, in sort of connecting with that aspirational side of yourself, there is absolutely something very powerful to be gained um, in when you do pour yourself out for somebody else. And there's just no question about it. Doesn't mean it's easy. You know, that's the, that's where you on the front end of it perceive the sacrifice. But then when you dive into it, 
when you dive in and, and I know just from my own life, some of the hardest things that I've done in my life have also been the most rewarding. It was sort of, there was this enormous barrier to diving in. <laughs> and then, but once you're in, you realize this is my purpose. This is what I'm supposed to be. I've never felt in, in a strange sort of way. I, I've never felt a greater sense of purpose and, and meaning and deep level satisfaction, even in the difficulty. And one of those things I know, uh, David and Nancy, it was the family's decision to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that is no small decision of giving of oneself and their family to their country. The two of you could talk about that because some would say, depending on which family you're going to be talking with or about, that that uh, continuum of what might be seen as uh, giving and it's subtractive versus additive always changes. So if, mm -hmm. if Nancy and David, you could talk about that because that is a huge decision made by so many American families. Well, we were living in Philadelphia in Center City at the time when David, I remember it so clearly, I walked into our apartment. We had two kids at the time and David approached me and said that he, he had a newspaper in his hand and he had read a newspaper article about a soldier who'd come home injured from the war and his wife and two kids met him at the airport. And he held up the newspaper and he said, adults have to fight this war. This is, this is something that's very important. And this gentleman did not love his wife less than I love you. And this is a moment, this is the defining, you know, this is a defining moment in our culture and we have to establish whether or not Americans have the backbone to finish this. And so I was, um, I, David is very, uh, you know, I, 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 it didn't completely surprise me, but at the time he was the head of a free speech organization and we did have two children. And so it was, it took me aback a little bit. And so over the course of uh, not very long, I just knew that it was the right thing for him to do. But after that, after that decision happened, I had so many people contact me and say, don't you have children? Um, you know, what is going on with your marriage that you would be okay with him being deployed and possibly not come back? Um, and so during that process, I really wrangled with the ideas that we're talking about now. Um, and one of the things that I decided that it's important to raise your children to see parents doing hard things. And it's not as important that David didn't get to attend all of the soccer games, although that is important. What is important is to emulate generosity, othersness um, in your life so that your children can grow up seeing that as an example. Or do it, not emulate it, do it, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, David, yeah. Yeah, the funny, the kind of, you know, looking back on it, I was kind of, a, I was an older, I was 36 when I said to Nancy, I felt like I should do this. And so the age cutoff was 35. I was an attorney who had not really gotten out of my chair for maybe a year. Like I was not exactly, um, let's just put it this way. There was no Michael Bay training montage <laughs> of me in <laughs> Officer Basic. So I went in, I, I'll never forget going into the recruiting station in Center City, Philly. And I, I had the exact same hairline I have now. I was actually probably about 15, 20 pounds more overweight. And I said, I, I want to join. And they didn't know what to do with me, except they sent me to Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey for a physical that I almost failed. But this was 2005 and they were desperate for people. So, you know, ultimately I had a pulse. And so I, I went in and it was the hardest, I deployed, so that was uh, uh, late 05. I deployed to Iraq as part of the surge in October 07 with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. And what followed was the hardest year of my life with nothing else close in contention. It, it was a very difficult deployment. I was a JAG officer, so I'm not gonna pretend that I was some guy who was busting down the doors I, you know, I, I went outside the wire. I was a, a uh, I was very proud of my service, but the way I put it is I served with heroes, the people and helped them as much as I could. And we lost guys. We, at one point, um, 
in April, March, April of 2008, our unit took a disproportionate number of the total casualties in of the American forces deployed, including guys who are, you know, closer to me than brothers. And it was unbelievably difficult. And Nancy was going through an enormous challenge at home as well. And, uh, but that I was actually thinking of that experience in my previous answer when I said, when we dove into this, um, I never, I never in a morning would wake up and think, I don't know what my purpose is. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, you know, I don't know who my brothers are. I don't know what my purpose is. And, and it was simultaneously incredibly difficult. Mm. And then also at the same time, in very incredibly meaningful, those two things were existing side by side in that test and to greater or lesser degrees, like that's an extreme. Not everybody is deployed in those circumstances, but to greater or lesser degree, that's how we live in times of real crisis where we're called to look beyond ourselves as we simultaneously have this burning sense of purpose and meaning. Yeah. And then at the same time, this immense trial. I, I, I love this story so much. I actually had heard versions of it, but this is the most personal account of this that, that, that I've heard. And, uh, from, from you all, and, and it's, it's so moving. I just have two quick reflections on this. The first is, David, what you're describing is, is often described within psychology as a difference between two types of well-being. One is hedonic, basically feeling good, and the other is eudaimonic, basically a, a type of happiness that really redounds to feel meaning and purpose. And sometimes those are at odds with each other. I mean, I think for many of us, the hardest times of our lives are also the, the moments that strip away our comfortable routines and show us really who we are and what we want out of life, who we want to be. And so oftentimes I think these other-ish sort of non-self-centered choices are about choosing, not just choosing uh, unhappiness and kindness over happiness and selfishness, rather they're choosing meaning over the easier hedonic well-being. And then the other reflection, Nancy, you said something really beautiful, which is that, you know, of course, it'd be great to be there for the soccer games, but your kids really learned a lot through modeling about what it means to be a person, right? The, what, the way that we make these hard decisions. And, you know, one thing that you might have done for them is make those decisions less difficult for them in the future, right? I mean, when people ask me, are, are humans good or bad, selfish or selfless? I think I, I say, yes, both, but more than anything, we are adaptive. We, we can mold ourselves to the environment in which we find ourselves. So if you live in a home or in a culture where it's just normalized to be there for other people, that will become much easier for you. And if you live in a home or a culture where you're told over and over again, people are selfish and that's normal and even healthy or the way to succeed is to be selfish, well, you're going to typically go down that route, right? So I think it's important for us not just to consider our own decisions, but to consider how the environments that we create will help people grow into versions of themselves that, that are more or less selfish. And that's consistent. I mean, we were that's what we tried to say in the book as well. Of course, not having the uh, number of plaques and certificates that you do on your wall, Jamil, uh, but Nancy and I were trying to say, you can be both at the same time, but so long as you're 51% uh, helping <laughs> somebody else or thinking otherish and, I don't know about that Adam Grant guy, you know, <laughs> I, I, I do like him if you make me only because he went to Michigan. So I'm in on that one. Uh, but yeah, that's what we were trying to say. And, and so we weren't too far off based on the studies and the research that we were quoting then is what you're saying, Jamil. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, these instincts will always live in us. And it's sort of just a, a matter of what we express. I mean, I think one tragedy that I see over and over again at levels, both large and small, is that when people start to think that selfishness is either natural or smart in some way, that it's a path to success, that becomes, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for them in a way that is not really helpful. So the, the psychologist Jennifer Crocker has this great research with new college students who get to college and, and they survey them once every week on what their motives are around their behavior, meeting new friends, pursuing classes, and then how they're doing. 
And it turned out that some students start out college with this idea that my motive is to become popular and successful and sort of make it about me. And if you survey them week after week, that predicts them becoming lonelier, more depressed mm. and more anxious over time. But guess what? That anxiousness and loneliness focus the, focuses them even more on themselves. So there's this sort of vicious cycle where once we get really into ourselves, yeah. we kind of lock in, we do things that alienate other right. people, we rupture our relationships, and we end up living in a lonelier, more well, self-oriented version of the world. Hold that because we want to know how to reverse that cycle. But I wanted to ask both Nancy and David where we have seen that based on what the two of you do uh, so well as you observe the world. Uh, both uh, in, in politics and not in politics, I'll just say in society writ large. And what are some of the examples as we sit here talking about this great debate, you know, again, selfish versus selfless, that really stands out in both of your, your brains. And I know you've been doing a lot of work since we uh, finished the book, Nancy, you and David have been, uh, you keep on going, you're like trains. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what is something that has stood out to you, Nancy? Well, while we were writing the book, Richard had to endure a lot of me complaining and uh, just being in total angst at the incredible breakdown of civil society over the topic of masks. I, I just could not, we wrote it during the global pandemic and I just could not wrap my head around the fact that my friends at church and my neighbors would refuse to do something that was so simple. Um, and to me, I, I couldn't understand it. I mean, maybe Jamil can help me think more charitably towards my friends, but I couldn't <laughs> understand it. It's just a piece of cloth. It's for a short amount of time. Why can't you put it on? To me, it just seemed like, you know, as we were writing the book and I was thinking about these topics, it was one of the biggest and most extreme examples of people just being unwilling to care for their neighbor in a good way. Mm -hmm. What about you, David? <laughs> well... It's tough to top that one <laughs> as far as like, a, like when you're talking about a source of, um, of frustration. But I think, you know, one of the things about that is that became kind of a marker of your community. It became uh, sort of an identifier as to who you were, who, who were your people, so to speak. Um, and because it became so polarized and that issue became so polarized uh, around politics and around sort of red and blue and all of that. And it was really a, a sign in which how tribal affiliations can often trump almost anything else in our, even in many ways, our consideration for our fellow man, because, and, it, and, and I, I don't, you know, one of the things about that is, um, you know, when you talk to people, they just thought you were being sort of a sheep, you were being silly uh, by going along. Right. And, and so that, that was something that was uh, incredibly discouraging, but at the same time, and flipping around in the pandemic, we often heard many, many stories of people who um, were behaved in ways that harmed civil society. We didn't hear as many stories, and but there were many of people who went above and beyond. Just, I know in our, our friend, uh, amongst uh, uh, friends that we have and people that we know, the way in which they said, okay, some of the people who are most isolated are older Americans. And I'm going to intentionally far more than I have in the last five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 years, I'm going to reach out to older family members, reach out to older people in the community and make sure they don't feel alone. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to tell a story on Nancy is uh, she actually reached out to somebody that uh, we'd known and actually we'd known because they um, was somebody who's very vocally didn't like me online. And Nancy actually made an effort Line to defend up, David. this person. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's, you know, a few people out there. And Nancy actually reached out to make an effort to befriend this person, found out that they were hyper isolated in the middle of the, the very, very early strictest lockdowns and made sure that this person had food supplies, made sure that this person was taken care of and their physical needs taken care of. And just as, um, you know, as Dr. Zaki was saying, that launched something wonderful. It launched a, a real and deep friendship that, re, you know, that has brought real joy to both Nancy's life and this, and this other person's life. And it started with being kind to someone who was not very nice to her husband. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're you're so right that that we oftentimes uh, focus so much on on bad behavior because it, it's somehow it's just attention grabbing, right? When people go to go to spring break to a pool party during a pandemic, or you know, hoard toilet paper, those are just things that that attract our attention because fear is really uh, is 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 very salient to us. Um, but you're exactly right that during the, I mean, really disasters in general, oftentimes reveal great wells of human kindness and togetherness. There's a great book called The Paradise Built in Hell by Rebecca Solnit that's about sort of how in disasters over the last century, you know, you hear the sensationalistic coverage of people falling apart and panicking, but in fact, Underneath that are these incredible stories of mutual aid, people coming to the rescue of, of folks who maybe are really different from them based on race or gender or, or class, boundaries that typically would have kept them apart. But hey, when, you know, if it's the 1906 earthquake and all the buildings around you have literally collapsed, then those boundaries matter a lot less. Suddenly you're part of this group defined by shared fragility, shared adversity, and ultimately shared identity, but I think, Nancy, to, to your point, and, and, and David, the way that you were putting it, I think makes a lot of sense too. Often what psychologists talk about would be parochial altruism or parochial sort of selflessness, right? That we're naturally, and this, this we could go back and talk about in Darwinian terms as well, we're naturally oriented to be there for people who are part of our group. But that often ends wherever we draw the line between us and them. And then a perverse thing can occur where being there for outsiders actually becomes a betrayal of our own group. In, in, in my lab, we've, we've done a lot of work on political empathy, people's uh, beliefs around well, what does it mean to listen to someone on the other side? I mean, it turns out that research in political science finds that it's very powerful to let you can find common ground pretty quickly if you just have an open conversation. But we find that people are actively uh, angry at and feel that it's a, that it's a, that it's a failure of, of their status as a group member. They're being a bad Democrat or a bad Republican if they simply empathize or listen to yeah. somebody on the other side. And that too becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If we decide, okay, wearing a mask, maybe it's just a piece of cloth, but if that's what one side wants me to do and I do it, I'm a terrible member of my own group. I've betrayed yeah. my own side. Once we get into the, that hydraulic sort of give and take thinking, then our otherishness really uh, goes <laughs> goes away, right? Because it, it, or it's, it's, it, there's a hard cap on it because we decide that doing something kind for somebody who's different than me is the same as hurting someone right. who's the same as me. But has it always been that way? Has it always been, if I give you an inch, you've taken a mile? I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe David or Nancy have, have thoughts on this and I, I, think, I think, yeah, yes and no. You know, I think one of the things that happens, I, I like how you talk about the hydraulic give and take, better known as the business model of Twitter, um, <laughs> that really makes, separates us into that binary and uh, has, you know, look, um, you, you held, uh, Richard, you held up my book a minute ago. Uh, and one of the things I write about in the book, it's a lot of it's about American polarization. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that happened to me when I was in Iraq in the middle of this uh, civil war is that I saw how polarized people could get around not just policy differences, there were policy differences between Sunni and Shia in Iraq, you know, oil revenues, how's the army going to be composed? Um, not just religious differences, there are theological differences between Sunni and Shia that had existed for a very long time. But when you actually talk to people who are involved in the conflict, what they had was a list of very genuine grievances. In other words, it wasn't the Sunni believe this or Shia believe this, it's what they had done. And often it was terrible. There were terrible things, like genuine things. And when I came back, I started to become a less partisan person as a result of that experience. At the same time, America was becoming a more partisan place. <laughs> and the thing that um, I began to see, thankfully not to the level of violence that I saw back in 07, 08 in Iraq, but what I began to see was a, a grievance, a, a, a two completely separate grievance narratives where somebody who was sort of in the right, the red cocoon had a list of offenses and a list of grievances against people in the left and on the left and in blue America and vice versa. 
And the thing that was so alarming to me was how I began to see that the very act of under of, of immersing yourself in the grievance began to dehumanize your opposition. And some of the things that I've seen is, uh, you know, among the things that I've seen is a, a, a real rise in attributing to people in that other tribe, dehumanizing characteristics. Mm. And that's where, you know, the self selflessness and otherishness comes into play in a powerful way because one of the ways to break through it is by selflessness is by otherishness and you know there's many ideas as to how we can do that politically but um, concretely in our community i think in many ways it's easier by exhibiting acts of kindness and human and charity towards people in our surrounding community regardless of whether they're on our you know which jersey they're wearing yeah, and part of it, it appears, I mean, it's also point of view. And, and Jamil, as you were listening to the conversation so far, uh, as Dave was saying, he his point of view changed as he, during his service abroad. And it, when he came back, the, it seemed like things were farther apart, but both could have been changing at the same time, right? Sort of like looking through uh, a lens that is, as you pull back, you're zooming in, both are changing at the same time, your focal length as well as, as your zoom at the same time. Um, one of the things uh, that I have found as a journalist, and unfortunately, you know, I do believe that it, it seems worse, uh, Jamil. Uh, you didn't answer the question, but I, it feels like it's worse only because <laughs> of the, the way that uh, we have dehumanized folks, second class citizens, um, you're not worth the same amount I'm worth. Uh, we can talk specifically of the latest headlines uh, at, at during this week uh, that we are here at the 92Y. And, and that is, you know, rash, you know, attacks against uh, Asian American, uh, you know, Pacific Islanders. Um, and it is shocking. It has left uh, my small community of 22 million Asian American Pacific Islanders feeling naked in many ways. Uh, all of a sudden, what happened? Um, but you know, it's not the first time in our in our history. There are the the mass killings that I've had to report on for hours, hour upon hour upon hour. We just had one in Colorado. Um, mm-hmm. I've I, I remember Newtown. It stands out in my my brain very very um, sharply and and very emotionally. And unfortunately, in the last ten years, because I'm that news. Well, breaking news guy, um, I've covered, I can't tell you how many mass killings. And I, that's not a muscle we want to get good at, but I've unfortunately uh, gotten pretty good at covering mass killings. And that's not something uh, I wanted to get good at. And and so as we see the increase of dehumanizing people, you're not even as good enough to be a human. Um, that is the frustration, I think, many Americans feel right now. And when we set out to approach enough about me, it really is what the idea that, you know, that we could be living through uh, various pandemics, but a selfish pandemic, if if we can say that, um, and that it is, you know, we do it pretty well, put it that way. We've gotten pretty good at it. Richard, Uh, one of my favorite parts of your book is, I know you've been through so much and you've been able to share some of that in the book, which is so powerful. Um, And you have encountered beauty amongst that ashes. You have reported in some of the most heinous things, but you encountered people who did not bend the knee to the, the worst inclinations of humanity. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, um, amongst those, um, and Nancy, as, as we were working on it, you know, there's always one person, right, that epitomized uh, selfishness, that they would have the right uh, and the thought that they knew better than others to the point that they thought that they could take life. And that, to me, is the epitome of selfishness, if, if I may even say even evil in some, some places, uh, that we... Well, we could walk away going, it's, this is a horrible place. But every single time we had that one or two horrible people or a group, depending where you're at, there were far more stories to be told 
about people who stood up and were heroic and invigorating and uh, redeeming in terms of my belief in what people can be. Um, yet they're not the ones leading the story, right? They're not the ones that brought me to the streets of Paris mm -hmm. or, or or the streets of, of, of Baltimore, or the streets mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Georgia, where, you know, depending where I'm at, we don't lead with that story. That's not the big headline. The big headline is the name and the picture, which we've we've become more careful about, Nancy, is that, you know, we don't like to go with the name and the picture so fast because that's probably a part of the problem. But yeah, there is uh, Tiffany Parada, who we bring up in the book, um, who with her four children in the back seat um, and her husband, there's a shooter in a car in El Paso, Texas, the three of you might remember it. And he's shooting randomly while driving down the highway. And they get shot at, they drive away. And then Tiffany and her husband talk to each other and they go, we got to warn the other people. Mm -hmm. So they turn around in their 20 something year old suburban with a big solid 454. And they, <laughs> they zoom past, back that truck up, right? Uh, <laughs> zoom right past that, that Accord. And he shoots at them again. They make it past, the, the car is shaking, the, the SUV is shaking, and they start screaming at folks they roll down their window saying get out of the way there's a shooter behind us in a car and, mm. and tiffany was saying uh people thought we were crazy you can imagine if you were on the street and then i was interviewing her and i said well what made you do it you said you had kids in the back and she said yeah i have my four kids and they're young right uh she said they're young i said well how old are they and she said you know there's john who is three and you know there's 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 uh Jane, who is six, and then she hits her third child and she starts to, uh, uh, she can't talk because she realizes what, she had everything in the world in that SUV and they decided together that they would go and try to save other people's lives. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's this um, organization, I don't know if, if you all know about the Carnegie Heroes Fund, um, which recognizes people who, uh, you know, just regular everyday citizens who put their lives at risk um, to do extraordinary good for others. And, you know, there are hundreds of these stories each year. And recently, one of my friends, Dave Rand, did an analysis of interviews with these people and basically tried to pick out what are the themes when you ask these folks, why did you jump into a burning car to save three strangers that you didn't know? Why did, why did you jump onto a railroad track or a subway track to save someone who had just had a seizure and fallen on, right? Who was a total stranger. And you, what you see is non-calculative thinking. You don't see people saying, well, I could save four people, but I'd have a 25% risk to my own life. What you hear about is an instinct just that this is my first thought. This is the first action that I took. And it sounds, Richard, like the story that you're telling, this family didn't think about the risk. They just thought about this is the right thing to do and we're going to make that decision right now. And I think it does speak to, look, obviously there are horrible, horrible actions that people take and, and hate and dehumanization are running rampant. And, and, and those are very multi-determined things. I, 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 I can't pretend to explain why people do awful things with any grand unified theory. But I do know that as you're saying, when that happens, there are often many more people who express the exact opposite instinct, right? Um, that, that, that express an instinct to help and do so even at, at great pain to themselves. Um, I, I, I do wanna say, you know, David, to, to your point from earlier, the, the way that dehumanization often occurs is across division, when people feel like the other side is an existential threat to them. And, and I think that's happened a lot more recently, yeah. right? And yeah. so there's this... Um, Why, doctor? Why, Dr. Zaki? Why does it happen more often? Well, I think partially because of the way that our media is structured. David, you were joking. Well, hang that... on a second. Wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> not you, not you, of course. But, you know, you, you had mentioned, David, that the business model of Twitter is basically division. And, mm -hmm. and that's true. One of my friends, uh, Billy Brady, has done a lot of research demonstrating that basically when people tweet in outrage or, you know, even in dehumanizing ways towards someone on the other side of an issue, 
they get rewarded through, you know, social reinforcement yep. of re basically attention, likes and retweets. And just like, uh, you know, a sugar reward for an animal that makes it more likely that they'll tweet in outrage again. So basically we've got this infrastructure that's jacking up our sense of division, our moral outrage, our dehumanization of the other side. And it, it that that really saps us of what I think is a deep uh, instinct towards collaboration and togetherness, right? So there's this um, psychologist, Lee Thompson, who studied what she calls lose-lose negotiations. Situations when it's two people come to an agreement that's demonstrably worse for both of them than some alternative. And people end up in lose-lose situations about 20% of the time if you study them in sort of like in, in economic tasks. And the number one predictor of being in a lose-lose situation is a zero-sum view of the outcome. If you think in these black and white terms that everything that, that this person gets comes at a cost to me and vice versa, then you're less likely to look for those solutions that could actually help both people. And I feel like our entire culture is caught in a giant lose-lose negotiation right now that is undergirded by this black and white zero-sum thinking. It's almost like we've lost the plot when it comes to the idea that we could work together on anything, and that too can then become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we decide there's no opportunity to do it, we lose the opportunity to do it and end up in a much worse position. You know, one thing that, uh, I, I, you know, there's so so many aspects to what you just said, uh, but there's a couple that I want to pull out about sort of our media dynamic. And again, hey, I'm in the media. <laughs> I'm in the media too. So it's uh, you are. So, <laughs> so I, I'll point piling... to David. It's David's fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not piling on Richard. Um, yeah, a couple of things happen. One is there's this term, and it goes all the way back to two, 2006, and it was popularized many years ago, you know, 15 years ago by Kevin Drum, uh, a writer many people may know, and it's called nut picking. Nut picking, and what nut picking is is when you take somebody who is an extreme, who does or says something extreme. They are an, an extreme outlier of one point of view, and you highlight what they did, and you try to cast that as representative of the other side. So you see this on Twitter all the time. If something terrible will happen, and 999 out of a thousand people are expressing appropriate sympathy. But always somewhere, you can find somebody with a blue check mark who's saying something insensitive or wrong or bad, and you'll quote tweet that and say, and if it's somebody in team blue, it's like, see, that's what they're like. Or if it's on team red, that's what they're like. And so what ends up happening is you get, uh, there's a, a great example of, um, uh, you know, when, when say somebody who's a, celeb uh, a celebrity or politician dies most people respond appropriately to that, but every now and then somebody doesn't. And you make that person famous for not responding well, and then you say, that's what they're like. And it creates that toxic bitterness. And then this other thing that um, the More in Common Project, which has done a lot of studies on American division, did this really interesting study that said the more, the better informed you are in the sense of the more political media can, you consume, the more wrong you are about the political beliefs of your opponents. You think they're more extreme than they really are. And mm. which is fascinating. And that's part yeah. of like this nut picking. And so it found that the people who are least engaged in political media had the most accurate perception of their political opponents. Why? Because they gained their perception of their political opponents by these really odd things called friendships <laughs> and relationships. <laughs> so they, they knew people. What are those? Believing they knew about people. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it's that absolutism that we, we live in that uh, one or zero that I think we, we're, we, we've kind of been talking about today. Right. And, and maybe we've got the wrong conjunction of selfless or selfish, but to say, and, or, or just, and, and maybe that's the way to think about it. In, in terms of why we are where we're at, um, what we toss around is we're out of practice. We we just don't let the, the friendships that we may or may not have. Like the, the, the thing about being in house is that we don't we're not exercising that muscle set right now of of empathy that you you write about, uh, Jamil. And because of that, potentially, 
our selfless muscle is really flabby, uh, you know, just really overweight at the moment. And that, you know, we're, we're pushing that the idea of muscle tone is what's needed right now in exercising that idea of thinking of other people. Um, and that by doing more of that, not getting it right all the time, right? That's, that's something else, right? It's, it, it, we're not going to get it right all the time. In fact, as, as the parents in this call know well, you know, falling down actually can be quite productive um, along the way. The one who fell downstairs when he was three and has a big gash in his head um, and, and, and is open to that. And so when, when we think of that idea, uh, Jamil, what would you say about that as to why we're in this, this, this difficult time of it's so easy to dehumanize folks that we are so selfish right now as a society? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we've talked ourselves into it. You know, we've 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 put ourselves into this tizzy where we just feel so scared of people who are dissimilar from us, and, and we feel as though, it, yeah, the, the writer George Saunders talks about our built-in Darwinian confusions, the idea that we must preserve ourselves at all costs, and that we are different than everybody else. And I feel like we have that writ large in our culture right now. I mean, the the good news is that we can at least research suggests we can do little things to break ourselves out of that. I mean, um, one of the, so I, I teach this class called at Stanford called Becoming Kinder. And, you know, we talk about the science of these topics, but I also give students these little assignments, just um, kindness challenges to, as you're saying, Richard, to kind of build that muscle um, of their uh, ability to be there for others. And one of the funny things is, how wrong we are. And I'm not picking on my students here. We are in general about what will make us happy or how we'll feel when we do something, right? So for example, one of the assignments is take a time that you feel really stressed, like you don't have the time or bandwidth for another person and just do something for someone anyways. Just, just show up for them in some small way. And my students will inevitably say, oh, I thought that this was gonna increase my stress because I've got so much on my plate. If I do something for someone else, that will just make me more overwhelmed. And the opposite was true. I ended up feeling happier, more relaxed, more empowered when I showed up for somebody else. Likewise, we have this assignment called disagreeing better, where I encourage students to talk with someone they disagree with, but to interview them about how they came to have their position, to try to get to know them as a person instead of sniping at each other. And students always think, oh my gosh, this is gonna be the worst conversation I've had all year, and then are shocked that there's actually a person on the other side of that debate, right? And that, that they can, even while still disagreeing, realize that there's humanity there. And so I think that sometimes it's those little steps, just getting over the hump, getting over our assumptions and developing habits of mind where we are willing to connect with other people that can teach us really that those habits are not painful, that they don't take away from us and can get, get us past Richard, as you're saying that, or thinking towards more of an and perspective. And Nancy, you've had quite a journey. You, you've uh, written in political spheres in your career and you've evolved and, and uh, changed and, and learned a lot, I think, based on what uh, Jamil has saying that you could provide about what others uh, have been thinking as you've been working with them. Yeah, you know, I have changed a great deal. I feel like I have a God-given talent to write. And what, what do I want to spend my time working on? Who do I want to promote? Whose ideas do I want to promote? And um, at great personal cost, I've sort of turned my back from politics. David's still, you know, neck deep in it. But I just decided I, I can't do that. That's why I loved Enough About Me. I loved working with you. And one of the things that Richard really um, brought home, Jamil, exactly what you were saying. He would repeatedly say, I'm not Mother Teresa, and I probably won't ever be, maybe. Um, but in the book, he, he includes a list of just things to do, just small things that you can do in your daily life. You can do it at the office. And he talked about not having a demarcation between your charitable life and your personal life and your occupational life, but rather that you don't, you don't have the ability to say, I'm going to be charitable personally, but at work, I'm going to be a jerk. Um, and so <laughs> Richard has a list in here, like how to be kind to your office mates. Um, I mean, 
I saw it in person. Like I know that Richard brings donuts to his coworkers when they can be together. Um, I know that he cleans the kitchen at NBC. Um, I, I've seen it. And so Richard, I think that's something that's very important that you included in this book that we're not necessarily asking people to be rock stars of selflessness, but rather you're just trying to turn the dial a bit. Yeah, little by little. And I guess uh, to the, the rest of the team here, is that the right way to do it? I mean, we Nancy and I looked at a lot of research. We had a, a researcher from the University of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, we did bring in a badger. That's OK, though. We, <laughs> we have a couple wolverines. But uh, when we were looking into the science of it, we believe that that was what it was telling us, that that would work. But of course, we have another scientist. Uh, we also have two other big thinkers uh, in, on this as well. So uh, based on what you said, Nancy, David, would you agree? And, and, and Jamil, would you agree with that? You know, you can disagree. I, we like it better, actually, if you disagree. But well, well, one thing I, I liked about what Jamil said was, you know, how he was talking about when it's difficult, do it. When, when it's inconvenient, do it. And it reminds me, this is a completely different area of science, but there's this, you know, principle in physics that static friction or starting friction is greater than sliding friction. It's harder to start and easier to stay go in motion. And I think that there's sort of like this sort of kernel of truth in, in our in our engagement with other people. It's often daunting to start. It's often quite difficult to start. But then once you start, it develops its own kind of momentum. And, and you know, that's just experiential to me. That's experiential. And I know that the plural of anecdote is not data, uh, but I have seen that in a lot of other people that once once it, the hardest part is that first motion, the hardest part is that initiation. And once you get into that motion, it de develops its own momentum. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the lives of friends and family. And, and that was what was interesting to me about, as Dr. Zaki was talking about with these students, that when it was difficult, um, you know, overcoming that reluctance has its own, it's difficult, but it has its own power as well. David, you're right that the plural of anecdote is not data, but in this case, the data back up exactly what you say, right? So we talk about this as activation energy as well in, in a social climate. And so like there is this great work that shows that people think that they'd be miserable. You ask them, how would you feel if you talked to a stranger on, on your commute today? And they say, oh, it'd be the most awkward conversation of my entire life. I would be miserable. And then if you induce a separate set of people to actually have a conversation with the stranger, they say it was the best part of their day. Likewise, there's all this research on how giving to others makes us happier. But if you ask people what will make you happier, they say, well, I'd rather just take myself out to lunch or buy a new handbag or whatever, right? So we've, we have these misperceptions. And I think that those misperceptions add to this activation energy. They add to this inertia to get out there in, in the social world. Um, and, and I think part of that is part of our job, at least my job as a psychologist is to give people the information that they can use to say, well, once you get over that hump, it's going to not just help other people, it's gonna help you too. You're going to be happier. You're gonna feel potentially more fulfilled. You know, to sort of go back to the comparison of being, you know, strengthening, strengthening a muscle. I think if we want to get in shape, we wouldn't say, okay, I'm going to reserve eight hours a week and try to run a half marathon or a marathon, right? You'd like, you know, your knees would suffer. You'd be unhappy. You would fail all the time and you'd not do it again. Right. Instead, we try to do a little bit every day. And, you know, when I go running the half hour before I go running, I'm pretty reluctant. I'm looking for an excuse not to do it. The half hour after I'm always grateful to have done it. Right. So the question is, can we likewise build habits that get people out there, even again, as overcoming that initial inertia? Sound like someone was going to say something, uh, you know, uh, how, how do we talk about this without it being so goody goody? I mean, this is, this is, isn't this a little bit sort of like uh, peaches and cream and, and, and rainbows and, and, and uh, pink ponies? Isn't this a little bit too much niceness stuff, y'all? Come on, isn't this a little bit too like, hi, good to meet you. Uh, let's talk about selfish, selflessness. Well, I will well, I mean, say that. Oh, go I, ahead. I'm sorry, Nancy. Go ahead. I'll say that there's a cost to, to selflessness. Um, so like when David decided to join the army and was deployed and came back, 
it was horrible. He'd seen um, genocide and, and sat knee to knee with Al Qaeda terrorist. He was not the same person that I married. Um, we've been married 25 years and I never saw that person again that left when he went to Iraq. Um, but likewise, I'm a different person. So I'm not the person he married. Um, and it, we went through some hard times and fought and because uh, I didn't understand what he'd been through and he wasn't able to properly convey it because you had to be there. Um, so we, you know, really struggled. Um, but it was such a huge, huge blessing because he became the person that he was intended to be. And I separately became the person I was intended to be. I'd never, I used to bounce checks and I got our water turned off and I would bounce <laughs> high checks. I didn't know how to live. And so when he left, I learned how to take care of ourselves financially. Um, and so I became more independent that way. I became a different sort of mother. I became a different sort of wife. And then he came back and he was different. And it, there was just a huge cost to what to that decision but it was the right thing because we're both different and we're both better but it's not this really happy story of rainbows and unicorns it's a story really of great loss um but also great purpose mm. Mm. yeah you know that word purpose i think matters a lot like i you know when when you think about um you know, what we have, you know, we have in this country, for example, we have a, cha a huge problem of what's called deaths of despair. You know, people who feel a, a deep existential sort of loss of purpose and loss of meaning. There's lots of reasons for the deaths of despair, but I think that's an incredibly vivid term that describes something very real. And what, it, and what is connected to that thing that is very real is often this loss of purpose. But you just can't go to someone and say, develop a purpose. <laughs> you know, yeah. that you just don't, you don't do not that. On the, and, it's not on the store shelf, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, one of the things I think about when you're talking about selflessness and you're talking about, um, you know, in, in, in your book and in the sacrifices that, that you've made that have been difficult, it is not easy. And we have given the sort of the, 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 the good news side of it, but there is a difficult side of it. But the thing I keep going back to when I think about um, service to others, and again, we do not hold ourselves out as models of that. We, you know, uh, what Dr. Rizaki was saying at the beginning, you got this bad part of you and you also, have, we, we've got that. Um, hmm. But, you know, one of the things that I have found is that part of that finding of a sense of purpose can be in intentional kindness and intentional efforts to serve others that that is uh, we all have the ability to do that not everybody has the ability to join the military or be in the peace corps or teach for america or you know all of these things you can think of but we do have the ability to ex to to be kind we do have the ability to serve in some way in some way and I think that that can actually has an ability that can provide purpose for people. And that's so critical and it's often so missing. Yeah. It's the, yeah, it's that first, uh, that first move, right. To, to find mm -hmm. purpose, um, is to do something that it, that is kind and is, and is for other people. And, and one of the things that is really like right sitting in the corner in the room, uh, you know, that elephant we like to talk about for me is, this is a, a book uh, about being selfless and what are we doing? But we're talking about me in the book. And so <laughs> all of you are very kind not to bring that that up, but uh, <laughs> it's been the weirdest thing for me uh, in the building of the book and then uh, promoting the book, but it really does remove that or and puts in the and because uh, we, we, we did that uh, purposefully and, and Nancy remembers the debates that we we had about it because we had to show a little bit of vulnerability not a little bit as much as possible that I was capable of of, of sharing um, and I I do think that that vulnerability is part of that selfless muscle that it is important that we find that that happy uh, balance um, when we are with you know dealing with other folks 
that we we do find that space because that is part of being selfless and and showing that you know i i do care about you enough that i will share this with you that i will give this to you and you know i felt that in in filming uh, the movie on student caregivers and military families that each family was giving me something like they they were saying here you go richard this is this is yours and that i felt uh, and nancy was out there with me when we were filming and it was something i needed to guard uh and i need to take care of to the very end in the edit phase and now that we go to go to market in may with it that i would from the beginning to the end value that vulnerability that they gave me and i think that was a bit of their trust i i thought it was a bit of their selflessness knowing that you know i'm i, I don't know what's going to happen with this but i know it might help other people yeah i think that that oftentimes sharing our own stories um, is one of the most powerful things we can do. And it can feel selfish and it can be selfish. The same action can be selfish or selfless depending on how we're experiencing it and what's motivating us, right? We can tell our stories to big up ourselves and advertise our personal brands, or we can tell our stories because we think that they will, they will actually provide meaning and inspiration to other people. I mean, Richard, I, I'm, I'm confident that you did so in the latter way. And you know, I, I guess, just to return a little bit to the rainbows and unicorns version. Pink ponies is what I said. But, oh, uh, pink ponies. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay. Right. We can go to unicorns. Uh... <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I get this all the time, right? I mean, as somebody who studies um, kindness and empathy, of course, I get uh, charged with naivete, like on a nearly daily basis. And I think that hope in the human condition and hope in people and recognizing that there is good in us and does good for us is the opposite of naive. I think that we've oftentimes, we need some counter programming to, to what is a really overly simplistic narrative that's been building that people are just generally awful, right? I mean, cynicism is, is on such a huge rise in, in the 1970s, more than half of Americans said that most people could be trusted. And in 2018, only 30% of Americans said that, right? So we, we're developing a really simple and really negative view of ourselves and each other, and it's hurting us, right? I mean, at the same time that cynicism is rising, so is depression, anxiety, and loneliness. And, and I think that to recognize that there is another side of us, that there is a selfless side to us, and that it's very powerful, and it's really, really prevalent, and it's really helpful, it's not the same as saying that we're only good, but I think that right now we, I mean, even to the point of the chapter in, in your book where you say, it, could selflessness even exist? The fact that we have to ask that question is so profound to me because you know it, it suggests that we have talked ourselves into such a singular view of people as terrible uh, that we need to then provide some evidence that we're not always terrible. And I think that that's not just useful and, uh, true to the data, I think it's important to give people another sense of who they can be. We we started by saying the great debate, self-ish or self-less. I'm going to give you all 10 stones. You got two buckets. And I want you to put the number of stones that you think you are in the self-less and self-ish bucket. And then I want you to also do the same for society where would you put those 10 stones? And in marketing parlance, this is our conjoint analysis, very simplified. Um, but I, I, I love conjoint analysis and I don't have, and I don't want to take any more of your time. So we'll use the 10 stones really quickly on this. And uh, I'll start with Jamil first, then David, and then Nancy. Okay, so I'm answering from myself personally in my And history. then society, 10 yeah, stones. Um, so the selfless, I, I'd like to think of myself as like maybe six and four in favor of selflessness. But I mean, it, it, I also want to say it varies from day to day and year to year, you know, and like having kids, I think, changed me to, to be le less of a self, selfish person. But, but yeah, to, to do the simple answer, I guess I'd like to think six versus four. And then for our culture, uh, <laughs> It's so, it's got to be five and five, but with so much variance, you know, and again, I, I want to really hammer home that we are still putting the stones in the, in the buckets as we speak, right? So I don't want to say that our story is done, but, um, but I mean, it, I, I, there's just, 
it's so hard to say that we're more one or, or, or the other that I have to hedge and say five and five. You're not hedging. I couldn't tell at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Jamil, thank you for that. David? You know, I'm reminded of, uh, was it when the, the theologian G.K. Chesterton was asked, what is the problem with the world? And his response was me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, look, I, I know myself well, and I'm going, I'm seven, three or eight, two on the selfish side. Um, I, I have a kind of a pessimistic view of human nature and a pessimistic view about myself. So I'm going to say I'm seven, three, eight, two. And I think that I just, uh, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of the median person. <laughs> so seven, three, eight, two, I'd say. Hmm. Nancy. So I was going to quote Chesterson as well. Um, I was going to use that very quote because I feel like I frequently am the problem. I sometimes can rise to the occasion and do amazing things, but if someone asks me to get them something out of the kitchen, I'm supremely annoyed. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm more selfish than not. I don't know how to quantify it. Richard and I always had these fights while writing the book. I was like, I don't understand the 10 stone thing, but, um, Richard, uh, you know, he, he thinks differently, but, um, so for me, I think I would probably be a seven out of 10 on selfishness to be completely honest, if not eight and at moments 10, um, <laughs> and for, I mean, just to be honest, I would disagree with David's assessment because he's he's really amazing. I've seen him over the course of 25 years make so many very important decisions that have shaped our family. Um, and for the culture, I don't know. I don't think I'm any better than the culture. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say, I don't know, five and five. I'm depressed over the mask issue and other things, but I don't want to be so <laughs> charitable after Jamil is right here listening to us and told us so many things that we need to reflect on. And I would say that uh, I'm probably a six or seven uh, on the selfish stones and, and therefore three or four on the selfless stones. Um, and I would probably reflect that that would be um, the world as well. Um, and that we, we've we got we got some work to do uh, and hopefully we can stay in that oscillation that happens all the time more on the other side which is more selfless as, as the stones get tossed into the other bucket. If you were to meet somebody in your spheres of uh, friendships or, or influence, um, how would you describe this topic of selfless or selfish? And then also, how would you describe or bring up this topic with somebody that you would never hang out with? Start with either one first. How about you, Wait, Nancy? A, David, yeah. you go first. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> no, Nancy, uh, Nancy, I, I'd love to hear what, give me more time to think, Nancy. <laughs> yeah, one of the things you talk about in Enough About Me is having lunch with somebody with whom you would never typically have lunch. And that was so powerful to me. And I've seen that play out in my own life that when I sit down with someone who I think is my enemy, that as Jamil said, I can increase my empathy and really it's the only way. And it's hard. It's hard to do because you have every sort of inclination not to. But if I was sitting down with someone um, that was different from me and talking about selflessness, what I would hope to say to them is, I know you're from a different tribe. What is it about you that I misunderstand? Because I would love to hear it. Um, and you know, that conversation, I think, would bear fruit. Yeah, and that study came from Stanford, too, uh, that if you had three meetings, that the uh, evidence and indicators of prejudice between two individuals racially based in, in their study, that the, the measurements or indicators would go from here down to just above zero. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Zaki, you could have been part of that without me knowing because you, you do a lot of stuff at the same time. But that was really influential to the three lunches idea or the three meetings or the three coffees or the three whatevers that you want to do together um, that Nancy was alluding to that we worked on. David? Yeah, um, that, that's, that's a great a great answer. Um, <laughs> it's hard to improve on it. <laughs> so I, I would say, you know, when you're talking about um, with people that uh, you know and that are within your circle, I think one of the most one of the biggest challenges we just have as a people in, is in repairing our civil society. Um, 
And I remember, you know, there's this influential book written several years ago called Bowling Alone that yep. in many ways was so prescient about the time in which we live. And, yeah. and I think that one of the things that I, uh, in talking with people that, you know, I know and, and I'm close to about becoming a joiner, you know, in some way is the, can, what can we do to, to be a part of something? I mean, in Putnam uses bowling leagues uh, as sort of a proxy for our, our, the way we are knit together in these little civic associations. But this has always been a part of who Americans are, going back to, you know, de Tocqueville talking about it was Americans, we form more associations, we form organizations, and we're losing a lot of that. And so, uh, you know, I would say becoming a joiner, like thinking about moving out of that, that straight ahead, the six inches in front of your face about your day, but what is it that you can join? What can you be a part of? And as far as people that you would never talk to uh, and rarely interact with, I'm just going to rest with Nancy's answer. I love that answer. Uh, what is it about? What is it about you that you want me to know? Um, Cause man, that's a, I need to, that's a great just conversation starter in general. <laughs> we should yeah, talk more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's so funny because uh, the French is think alike. They must have some, some f invisible fiber connecting their brains <laughs> because we actually brought up the the study in the book about bowling leagues um that was oh. so informative joining right joining mm -hmm. um richard when i was talking to uh senator ben sass about the bowling alone book he made yeah. a joke he said that if putnam wrote the book today it would be called scrolling alone <laughs> <laughs> so we really need to guard ourselves against this isolation that we have by just looking through social media all day yeah i mean while the physical isolation maybe of uh re 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 um re-strengthened our strong ties which we're getting weak one might argue uh, there are, of course, the weak ties that we need to invest in uh, in our mid circles and, and not uh, as our inner circles get stronger at home, which uh, is probably another 92 Y discussion, but not for today. Uh, Jamil, what what would you do? Put on your put, take off your scientist hat for a second. Just take it off for me. Tell me what you would do with these two groups, uh, the okay. ones you know and one you don't know. All right, I'm gonna, I'll take off the hat in a moment, but let me just keep it on for one more second because I wanna reinforce something that Nancy and David are saying, this question of, you know, when you're talking with someone who you would never talk with, what would you like me to know about you? Help me understand you. So I, I wanna shout out one of my students, Luisa Santos, who has a really powerful new study that, that we're in the process of publishing now where she convinced some people before they had an inter-party discussion that hey, empathy for the other party is not a betrayal of your own side. Openness can create common ground that you didn't see. She then had these, these people write a letter to somebody who they really disagreed with about gun control. And we sent those letters to somebody on the other side of the issue. And we found that when we just seeded writers with the idea that empathy can be useful even across difference, they wrote notes that more appealed to common American values as opposed to sort of sniping at the other side. And the person on the other side of that letter, the person who read it, liked the writer more, expressed less prejudice to the political party of the writer and was more persuaded. In other words, when we told people empathy can be useful, even in this fraught political situation, it became useful, right? And I guess that would get to, so now I'll take the scientist hat off. And All right, come on, take, 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 <laughs> off, take off the robe, take off the hat. <laughs> the scientist hat is like a very Harry Potter, you know, eight-sided sort of uh, situation, <laughs> but, um, but so I guess just talking to anybody about selflessness versus selfishness, I think what I've come to believe more than ever is that we really, we, we tend to be looking for an answer of who are we? Are we selfish or are we selfless? And, and we tend to gravitate towards examples of great harm and awful behavior and say, aha, that proves that people are selfish. And what I would encourage any, anyone listening to do is to try to get past that thinking of what we all are all the time, because there's just no answer to that question. And I think instead that, that, our, that selfishness or selflessness is a choice that each of us makes 
every day, every hour, every minute. And that the sum of those choices in the end tells the story of our lives. And that the sum of those choices across us tells the story of our culture. And it's, it's a story that we are writing all the time. Uh, and, and one that I hope people feel empowered to write themselves. Yeah, there's two things I would say. One is um, we make a conscious choice um, roughly about every 15 minutes uh, of what weight, you know, that's above my pay grade. But we make one every 15 minutes. Why not at that moment try it out? Uh, what is it that I could do that would be for Jamil or Nancy or David uh, every 15 minutes? If, what, what is that? If, if I'm going to go get a cup of water or go get a meal, uh, what is it that I could do? And, and I, I'm not trying to cheat the question I asked, but I would use it for both groups. Uh, the, the other thing I would do is just ask, uh, how are you? And really listen. Mm -hmm. How are you really doing? Um, and I think what we forgot is that there's a lot of things happening behind the, behind the forehead. And sometimes we just see the forehead. But we have to ask, how are you? And, and really think of the brain and the heart. What is it? What is it? What is it doing? How is it? How is it moving? Right? Not like my, some like like my fingers. Um, and I think if we can do that, we get outside ourselves uh, and can think um, enough about me. So, what is your big big idea? Your grand slam, if you will, of selflessness. If you, if you could do it, what what would that be, Nancy? <laughs> so I'm supposed to have this big idea. Um, I would say that I love this Russian writer, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he says that the line separating good and evil passes not through states or, or classes or political parties, but through every human heart and through all human hearts, and that the line shifts inside us and it oscillates over the years. Um, and I think he goes on to say that even within the hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And I feel like that's my life, that we, we talk about it in such a way that we believe that we are the good people and the bad people are out there. And if we could just identify the bad people, we could make society better. And David and I have been investigating this huge, uh, you know, cover up and over and over we were told by people that they didn't see it coming because they weren't able to identify the snake in the grass. And I think if we just sort of dial down our language about morality um, and we don't think of ourselves as so amazing that we're not capable of bad things or that the people that we interact with are not capable of evil things if they have nice manners or if they belong to the right club or the right church. And I think if we could think about that Solzhenitsyn quote about how the line dividing good and evil is right here. And we go back and forth on that line and we don't put people on the pedestal and we don't count everybody out. I think that would really change the culture. Mm, thank you so much. That's awesome. David, what do you think? What's your grand slam? <laughs> Big idea. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not to put politics into this, but there was something that happened in the 2020 primaries that I loved. Now that's going to be hardly anyone says that about politics ever. <laughs> and this was Andrew Yang said, if when, you know, how po people say, you know, when I'm elected, I don't know if he said when I'm elected, but he said, if I'm elected, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the county that voted against me the most. That's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the county that voted against me the most and can't remember it was some some the next thing was going to be you know to hear what they have to say to assure them that i'm looking out for their my best interest you know their their best interests and that really stuck with me as sort of this tangible way um to manifest something that is the big idea mm -hmm. um love your enemies like that's the big idea mm -hmm. and in that sense he, he wasn't mean enemies more political opponents but it was uh what is a tangible way in that I can express a concern and regard and affection for those who oppose me? And that that's the big idea. Love your enemies. Both two to, well, they, they set you up there, Jamil. You, they're both uh, tough to beat here. What do you got? <laughs> um, that our stories about ourselves and each other matter. And we've maybe been telling the wrong one in a number of different ways. You know, I, I think that 
especially in American culture these days, we're so oriented towards the individual. Um, I think a lot about um, uh, one of the famous late speeches that Martin Luther King gave, he talked about the drum major instinct, this desire that we all have to lead the parade, to be out front. And, um, you know, I think that, that we as a culture have really been living that more and more, so focused on ourselves. And we've, we've come up with a story in which that's the right thing to do, that's the wise thing to do, that's the path to success. And, and I think it's, it's killing us in a number of ways. It's, it's, it's sapping us of meaning and it's making us convinced of a very cynical view of who we are and, and, and who everyone else is. You know, I'm not here to say that actually it turns out we're a hundred percent kind, but I think that in really important and really ancient ways, we are a species that is built for togetherness. And when we can honor that in small or large ways um, within our families or across difference, I think there is this sense of coming home in a way of, of being true to ourselves at a deep level. And with that truth um, comes meaning. So I guess, you know, our stories matter. I think we've been oftentimes telling the wrong one. Um, I don't think that there's one right story, but I think that, that we can balance that out and realize that there really is selflessness in us and that, that expressing it is, is um, it also expresses a deep truth about, about humanity. The United States is an American industrial power, and we are good at building great things and coming up with great uh, ideas. And uh, potentially, as we look past to the 70s and 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s, we have come to a time where we've really perfected uh, tools and devices to strengthen what is our, our great tradition which is freedom of speech, certainly. And I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm speaking here to a, a lot of big brains on this topic on, on this Foursquare here. But we've really perfected, I think, our ability to say, I need to be listened to, uh, maybe to a point where we can redirect some of that energy and that that greatness that we, we have in the country to go the other way to see how we can uh, help others and be part of others. And, and with that backdrop, um, and again, that is one person's opinion, uh, that we might consider something big, uh, potentially like a, a world selfless day, uh, something that is global, that is national, that is local, that we can reemphasize uh, the importance in that, that existence and that, that very value uh, that I think brings all religions together and all cultures together in a way that, you know, we, we wouldn't mind uh, experiencing nowadays. So that's my grand slam. Well, uh, I we got a little bit closer. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. I've really appreciated this. Um, Jamil Zaki, thank you so much. Author of The War for Kindness, as he digs into um, how we can understand ourselves and other people. Uh, through the decisions we make and the way we think about the world. Jamil, thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. Yep. Uh, I will not hold against you that you're at Stanford. That's okay, <laughs> though. Uh, thank you so much, David French, uh, for bringing all of your experience and wisdom. Author of Divided We Fall, great book. You got to check it out. Thank you so much, David. Uh, and then Nancy, thank you so much for being on the horse with me for this one enough about me her latest collaboration uh five time new york a uh, five time new york times bestseller nancy thank you so much for being my book sherpa uh as we worked fun. on this yeah it's thank you thank you yeah thank you so much and thank you all for being here at the 92y uh for uh, a talk and we always enjoy being here on the stage to discuss big ideas and the big idea today is how can we be self less more? Thank you all.